So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this edition of the NITEX uh, colloquium. Uh, my name is Francesco Petruccione, and I'm at the moment the interim director of, of, of NITEX. Uh, today's speaker, speaker is Dr. Yapi uh, Grief. Yapi uh, has almost 20 years of experience <clears throat> in electronic engineering, software development, and education in various South African uh, institutions. He's worked for research institutions, startup companies, uh, corporate, big corporate companies, and is now a lecturer at the Northwest uh, University. At the moment, he's also the deputy director for the School of Computer Science and Information System at the same uh, university. Yeah? And uh, <clears throat> uh, his research is mainly uh, around engineering education and serious games and gamification. So we will be out to uh, watch a lot, have lots of fun this in the next in in the, in the next hour. Yeah, and um, and today he will speak about aligning student and educator capstone project preferences algorithmically. Yeah, and that sounds quite quite interesting. So Yapi, if you would like to share uh, your screen, you're most than welcome to start with your presentation. And uh, uh, while you do that, the usual reminder <clears throat> to the participants to please make use of the Q&A facility or just to raise your hand uh, if you want to ask uh, uh, a question. And, and after the talk, uh, we will meet <clears throat> for a short while uh, in our social gathering uh, virtual uh, room yeah, in, in Kumo space. And according to plan, the page should have opened in your browser, but I will share the link in the in the chat just now. So yeah, I see I can see your 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 your, your slides. You're most than welcome to start with your presentation. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the introduction, Francesco. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to this talk. Um, I think this is going to be a little bit different to what is uh, generally presented at a, at a Nutex colloquium. Uh, so I'm hoping that you will find this interesting and that you will learn something. So the title of this talk is Aligning Student and Educator Capstone Project uh, Preferences Algorithmically. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the wider project this was implemented in as well, uh, just to give a little bit more uh, you know, feel for, for what, the, what the overall project was about. So in terms of uh, what we will cover today, uh, I'm gonna talk about uh, who we are. So obviously I didn't do this completely alone. Uh, this work was part of my PhD. So I obviously worked with, with a number of my supervisors in this. Uh, so I will just introduce who we are in, in terms of the project team, then do a little bit of an introduction into the project and what it was for and what our goal was, uh, a little bit of the theory that informed the, the designs we did, then uh, some of the systems that we implemented being a location-based game, a challenge-based system, and the tender game, which is the specific one that I'm gonna be talking about in this talk. And then some of the results we obtained from our first runs, and then some of the following versions that obviously grew from the, the initial uh, design. Uh, I see there is a chat question. Oh, sorry, that was Francesco with the Kumo space. Okay. Um, so in terms of who we are, obviously there is myself, Jopi Hrief. Uh, so I'm from uh, the Northwest University where I'm in the Faculty of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, where I also head up the uh, Computer Science and Information Systems School for the Van der uh, uh, campus. I'm also involved at the Optentia Research Entity where I head up a small sub-program called Technology Capability and Function where we look at how technology is used to make people more effective in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, then from there, uh, I've got three colleagues from the, uh, the University of Johannesburg, Professor Andre Nell, uh, who's from the faculty of, or the School of Eng uh, Mechanical Engineering. He's also the operations director now for the University of Johannesburg. Then Dr. Rylan Heyman from Electrical Engineering. And then finally, Professor Jonathan Carroll, who's also from Electrical Engineering. Now, the idea of this project was to specifically look at capstone projects. And a capstone project is the final project that you do in whatever degree, uh, you know, where you look at all of the knowledge that you've gained in your degree in a summative way and try and put it together into one big project to kind of show off your skills. Now, many degrees have this, but it is a, a sort of key part of any engineering degree. Okay? And in 2016, we basically started with this idea of, of trying to enrich the capstone project experience for students. Okay? Uh, there were a number of issues that were raised 
in, in 2016 that we felt we could address by creating a system that not only simplifies some of the, uh, the procedural things that need to be done, but try and do things in a slightly more fun way and actually gamify it so that we can not only address the, uh, the issues that have been raised, but also try and address things like motivation and engagement that students have with their projects. Now, when I say gamification, that's this little bit of a loaded term uh, and different people use it slightly differently. In this specific uh, project, I just like to make a, a little bit of a distinction because there are different levels of kind of gameful design that you can go through. The first one being game inspired design, where you will just think in a way that is gameful. Uh, so you'll think about, you know, designs that are fun, you will you'll try and make things, you know, competitive, but but you're just inspired by games, you're not really creating games or gamified systems, that is what we would call game inspired design. Next, uh, we have this concept of gamification. Now gamification is where you use game inspired design, but you also add elements of games. So you're not making full games, but you're taking some sort of system and you're adding some elements of games generally things like points, badges, leaderboards, uh, you know, fun explosions, numbers that are constantly increasing. Uh, these are all ways that you can use gamification to increase the engagement people have with whatever system it is that you're trying to gamify. Now, there are many examples of this. Uh, one of the ones that, that generally people use is Duolingo, which is a language learning service that, that heavily gamifies uh, the, 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 the act of actually learning a new language. But you will also find it in, you know, fitness tracker apps and, you know, dieting apps or even rewards programs from different companies. These are all examples of gamification. Now, next, you will have this idea of simulations. Now, simulations are generally software where you will use gameful thinking and game elements inside of some sort of a virtual world. Uh, so simulations, you try and emulate things that are in the real world. Uh, generally for training purposes, but there is a distinction here between simulations and serious games, where simulations are things that are similar to games, but are not generally built to be fun. Serious games are also similar to simulations, but they are meant to be fun. So the distinction between a serious game and a normal game is that a serious game is one that is built for a specific purpose. So with a serious game, you're trying to teach something or convey some sort of a message to your audience, whereas a normal game is played simply for the act of, of having fun. Okay? So those are the different sort of elements of gameful design. Okay? Now, this may seem quite, uh, quite simple, but actually the idea of a game is something that is very ill-defined. Uh, and there's a huge amount of literature trying to describe what it is that a game is. Now, I've got here on the slide uh, one of the definitions put forward by Jane McGonigal uh, in her book, Reality is Broken, but uh, she puts forward four main elements of what makes up a game, right? She says that there needs to be rules that you need to adhere to, there needs to be goals, there needs to be some sort of a feedback mechanism, and there needs to be voluntary interaction. But when you think about it, a lot of these things would also apply to things like sports. Uh, you know, what is the difference between a game and a sport? Uh, sometimes people also find that there's difference between, uh, what's the difference between games and gambling, as an example. Uh, you can also find specific examples of games that are clearly games, but that don't conform to this specific definition either. So for example, uh, there's a game called A Thousand Blank Cards, where you will take a number of players and divide amongst them a number of cards that are completely blank. And then each of them takes an opportunity to draw on the card some sort of a card uh, or game card. So it can be something like a normal playing card. It can be a card similar to what you would have in Uno. It could be a card similar to what you would have in Monopoly. Uh, but the idea of a thousand blank cards is that everyone goes in their separate ways designs their own cards, and then you throw them all together and you play and see what emerges. So it is essentially a game without rules. The rules will emerge as the game is played. And in many instances, no rules ever emerge. So that is an example of a game that has no rules. You would also have games like Minecraft uh, on computer, 
which is a great game to play in and people build things and spend a lot of time in it. But Minecraft inherently, at least in its initial uh, instantiation, had no goal. Uh, you would play in the game and you could make up a goal if you wanted to, but there was no inherent goal in the game itself. And yet we still identify it as a game. There are also examples of games without feedback. So a famous one here is a, is a, is a psychological game called The Game, where effectively the idea is that you would write down uh, either notes or some people do it as graffiti, uh, referencing the game. And the only rule of the game is that if you think about the game, you've lost. And when you lose, you announce this, and then a new round of the game begins. So the idea is that you would never think about the game and you could only ever lose, okay? But the person who initially wrote the note or wrote the graffiti that made you think about the game, they would never get any kind of feedback. So for the most part, that is a game that, it, that doesn't have a feedback element, and yet it is still a game. And finally, serious games uh, are a great example of games that are often played without voluntary participation. So when you are using some sort of a game-based system or you know, a corporate getaway where you play games uh, in order to get to know your colleagues better, even though you are playing a game, you are also kind of forced to be there. So even in this definition of what a game is, you can find examples that break all of those uh, characteristics. Now, uh, another very useful definition that is used often is one by Tekkenbass and Zimmermann, where they try and actually subvert this whole conversation and say that games are inherently very difficult to define, right? So they create this concept of a magic circle. And they say that you will recognize when you are in a game. It is an inherently human thing that you can recognize the act of playing a game, right? You can also see people play a game and you can draw in your mind a magic circle around that and identify which parts of the game are internal to the game and which parts of the game are external to the game. So these are you know, just two definitions from the literature that, uh, that we used obviously when we were thinking about our design of things. But uh, I'm not going to spend too much more time in that theory, but it is an exceptionally interesting part of the theory uh, from, uh, from a perspective of game design. Now, in our project specifically, uh, we looked at things obviously from a more educational and you know, practical point of view. So what we were trying to achieve with this project was to increase the, the experience or the, to enrich the experience that students had in their capstone projects and also increase their motivation and level of engagement. And looking at the literature from, from psychology mostly and positive psychology specifically, we came across this concept of self-determination theory. And self-determination theory is a little bit of an umbrella term for, for a number of sub-theories, but basically it describes the characteristics of, uh, of a situation that you're in that are going to bring about this idea of you being intrinsically motivated to perform uh, actions in that system, okay? And they say that there are three elements that you need uh, in order to feel intrinsic motivation. You need to have autonomy. So in other words, you need to have in the system a way for you to make decisions and for you to feel that your decisions actually matter. So if you're doing things, uh, you know, without giving or without being given any choice for it, you're generally gonna feel some sort of resistance for it. So the more autonomy you have, the more likely it is that you will have intrinsic motivation. But on top of that, you also need an ability to show mastery. So you don't wanna be doing things by choice that are constantly the same. Uh, you want to have something that you can do better and better at. Uh, you want to be able to show for yourself and to others that you have the ability to actually master the task that you are given, right? What feeds into that quite nicely is this idea of community, right? So it doesn't necessarily help that you can try and master a process if you can't actually show it off to people that would understand what that mastery means. So if they're going through the same process you are going through uh, and they see what you are doing and it is perceived as being you know, a masterful way of doing, thing, uh, doing things, that is a way for you to feel an intrinsic motivation to want to do better. So we drew quite a lot from self-determination theory and this idea of intrinsic motivation to, uh, to kind of inform our designs 
uh, to try and you know instill this feeling of intrinsic motivation into students, right? So those were the three kind of gradients of abstractions we pulled from uh, self-determination theory. But then we also looked at you know the course, the the capstone uh, project course, and we realized that there are different levels uh, that we could address things at. So for example. There is a physical level. There is an actual process or an actual system where you know pieces of paper are being moved around when students register, when they hand in work, when they are you know interacting with faculty members. Uh, there's a lot of physical actions that can be made uh, you know more efficient if we automate. And automating those sorts of things is generally not particularly hard, right? Uh, but at the same time those physical actions are generally driven by procedures. So there are actual business processes that, that inform you know, the movement of that paper. So in this example uh, of our course, there would be things like the actual allocation of projects, you know, how that is designed uh, inside of the course is a procedural way of looking at things. So that was our second level of abstraction. The third level, because we're obviously looking at this from a gameful design perspective, was the ludic layer. Uh, so ludic meaning uh, gameful in Latin. Um, I may be butchering my Latin, but it's it referring to games. And this was basically the level of abstraction that we said that at that point, if we understand what the processes are inside of this course and inside of obviously the wider university that it fits into, we can take those and we can try and gamify them to try and make uh, both the content that is being conveyed to students a little bit more fun, but also to try and, you know, shuttle them through the course more efficiently uh, by, by gamifying the elements of the system, okay? Then obviously there was this idea of community. So previously, although there is a classroom experience, uh, students would obviously do their work very individually. So as much as they have mastery, they didn't really have a way to show it off to their fellow students uh, or faculty members. So we wanted to have you know, a level of abstraction there where we try and address this idea of community and, and try and create something that students can share between themselves. And then finally, right at the top of the pyramid or at, of the triangle, there is this element of ethics. Um, so we felt that in terms of autonomy, community, and mastery, autonomy is something that is fairly easy to implement because it relates to the physical actions people have to do and the procedures that they need to, to, uh, to do them under. Um, the ludic and community layer obviously feeds quite nicely into the community aspect of, uh, of self-determination theory, but that is a little bit harder to implement than the procedural or the physical uh, concepts that we need to address. And finally, when you're trying to show off mastery, once you've taken on you know, academic work and uh, specifically things like engineering, it's only once you master things that you can really start having conversations around uh, you know, ethical things. Uh, you need to have a fairly good understanding of what it is that you're doing before you can understand what the impact and implications of that is. So we felt that uh, the autonomy side of things uh, in terms of implementation complexity, it's fairly easy to do. Community, harder, but still fairly easy. But mastery was very, very difficult. Uh, and I don't know if we actually got to the point where we really addressed ethics in a meaningful way from a gamified perspective. Uh, on the left-hand side of the, of the theory diagram, we obviously looked at, as I mentioned, implementation complexity. So as you go up these levels of abstraction, it gets more and more and more uh, intense. Um, there's also a level of engagement that is required for you to get anything out of this as a student. Um, so physical things, there's not a lot of engagement required for you to actually get value out of the system because it will obviously just do it for you in an automatic way. But when you want to you know, get some value out of the community, there's a level of engagement that's required from you. You need to actually put things into the community for you to get anything out of that. And if you are going to try and engage with things from, a, from an ethics or mastery perspective, there is a lot of engagement that is going to be required of you uh, in terms of the way you, you will interact with the system. And then finally, uh, we looked at uh, Bloom and Crothwell's uh, taxonomy of educational concepts and specifically the effective domain. So most people I think at universities will be familiar with Bloom's taxonomy in the cognitive domain. They also published, or Bloom and his colleagues also published an effective domain where the levels 
uh, of the effective domain are that you would first receive information. So uh, this is looking more at the emotional aspect of uh, interacting and getting uh, motivated to, to do your studies. Uh, when you are not particularly stirred in an emotional way, you can receive information, but, but it's really gonna stop there. So, I mean, that's where you've got students that are listening to a sage on a stage, uh, you know, the lecturer is giving out information, the students are listening to it and they're writing notes, but they're not really engaging in a, in a particularly meaningful way. Then the next level of the effective domain, you've got the responding to information. So now you receive information and then you respond with an answer. So obviously when you call out a specific student to answer a question in class, they automatically have more of an effective, uh, you know, interaction with the lecturer uh, because they're being called on specifically. Next in the effective domain, you've got valuing information. So this is now, once you've received it, you can respond to it and you can start thinking about it and making a value judgment as to whether you think this is information that is worthwhile for you uh, to integrate into your knowledge or not. Uh, next, if you decide that the information that you've been given is actually valuable and it actually stirs your emotions and makes you think that this is something that, that is worth knowing, you will organize it uh, into your uh, into your knowledge of the, or the greater you know uh, system of your knowledge, um, so you will try and understand where this piece of information that you've been given that has now sort of stirred you emotionally, uh, you will try and fit it, fit it into your view of the world, right? And then finally, once you understand where it fits in, you can decide whether you want to internalize that into your own sort of being and make this, uh, this knowledge something that's intrinsic to you or not. And obviously for the effective domain, this goes from the bottom to the top. So receiving is very simple, uh, whereas actually internalizing information requires a lot of thinking and you know, uh, uh, reflecting uh, on the part of the student before they will actually internalize knowledge. Okay, so, so that's sort of the, the boring theory uh, that, that informed a lot of the designs that, that we went through. But the next step is obviously to, to introduce the project in and of itself. So uh, as I mentioned, we had these five levels uh, of abstraction where we looked at the physical, procedural, community, ludic, and ethical elements. And we used that in addition to these concepts of structural and content gamification. So structural gamification is where you are literally using gameful elements to shuttle students through a course or you know, participants through a course. Um, whereas content gamification is where you take whatever content it is that you're trying to convey and make it a little bit more fun. Um, so they're both element or both techniques of gamification. They're just obviously slightly different. And then finally, this idea of serious games, where we wanted to create games to solve you know, certain problems and have students actively participate in a gameful way uh, you know, to, to try and solve some of the problems. And we took uh, you know, this, these concepts and we wrapped them up into a project site. Uh, so that was also the, the, the main sort of vehicle that we would convey information on. And on top of that project site, we designed four games. Okay, so the first one is the, the location-based game. The next one was the challenge-based system. Then there was the tender game. And then finally, the research question battle. Research question battle, unfortunately, stayed in the, the design phase. We didn't implement that as a serious game at the end, but the other three are ones that I will talk about today. Now, as we were thinking about this and the way students obviously interact with the course and uh, the way information is conveyed to them in the course, we realized that in a capstone project module, students actually go through three distinct phases. So it's not like a normal module where you would get, you know, a bunch of information dumped on you and then you would write tests and do projects, write an exam at the end of the day. But I mean, you enter into it as a student and you exit it as a student. In a capstone project module, you enter as a student because it obviously builds on top of a general academic program, right? So you're used to this idea of, of getting information and trying to uh, you know, uh, bring it back to the lecturer in terms of tests and project stuff, but you've never taken on a meaningful project. So even students that have done project-based works in their courses, uh, courses are quite small, whereas a capstone project tends to be a big project, okay? So students enter as a student, right? Then there is a project that is assigned to them. 
through whatever mechanism, at which point they become a journeyman. Okay, so this is when they've actually gotten some big project that they now need to work through and actually deliver on at the end of the of the year, right? And this is a different way of doing things to what they've been used to previously. Okay? And then finally, once they've actually delivered their project, uh, we identified a candidate phase. So in engineering, when you actually finish your degree, you become eligible to become a candidate engineer, which is your first step towards uh, registration as a professional engineer. So once you've kind of uh, you know, finished your capstone project, and finish the, the journeyman phase, you're now entering into the candidate phase where you can say that I've done one thing, you know, appropriately in the way that an engineer would. And then you are now ready to take on the next step of your training, which is candidate engineering, uh, uh, you know, a candidate engineering position. So we looked at these phases and how the needs of students actually change at different points. And we decided to do the designs in a way that uh, the project system or the project site um, would be a constant, but the way information is displayed and the elements of the site um, changes throughout the year as the needs of students change. Okay, so the first one that we did was obviously the location-based game. Now, the location-based game happens twice a year. Uh, in the end, we actually found that it was more effective in the last instance rather than the second in or the first instance. So as students go through the middle of their journeyman phase, they have a mock seminar where they present the work they've done so far. And although we kind of tried doing it there, it didn't work particularly well because students weren't physically moving around. But the location-based game was very, very effective at the end of the process uh, of, the, of, the, uh, uh, of the capstone project, where students have now created their project and they're now presenting it at a project day to other students, to faculty members, as well as visitors from the general public. So um, obviously this is an opportunity for students to interact with each other, to interact with faculty members, um, as well as, as members of the public. Okay. So in terms of designing the system, basically what we did is we, we took over a building uh, on the uh, University of Johannesburg campus, looked at all the labs, and created these as beacons, effectively. So students would uh, take the, the physical project that they've built, obviously through their capstone project, and they would create a poster like they would do for an academic conference, right? And on this poster, they would add a QR code, which is generated by the system, okay? And the idea is that students would obviously man the, the desks where their projects are being displayed, whether they are inside or outside, or you know, in the corridors, or you know, in a specific lab, and they would want to interact with uh, different uh, people that are going through the, the building uh, and looking at different projects. So the interaction would happen that once you found a student that you found uh, that you've seen on the project website or just come across a student that had a project that you thought was very interesting, you would scan the QR code and that would allow you to log an interaction. Okay? And there was two different ways of logging interactions. You could either make a comment which is a public interaction on the sort of community system that we developed, or you could log a private interaction where it would only be visible to you, but it would still kind of contribute to um, the, uh, the health of the system. I will get to what that means in a moment, but basically you're tr we're trying to log you know, what kinds of interactions people are having, how they're experiencing the project, how they're experiencing the students that are presenting them. Now, uh, in addition to, to interacting with these projects, we would obviously use uh, one of the basic you know, concepts of, uh, of gamification, which is badges. Okay? So as you interact with pro uh, projects in specific study areas, you would gain badges for those specific study areas. And uh, in addition to badges, there were also focus badges, which I will describe in a minute. Now, why we did this, or the actual idea of, of doing this, is to obviously increase this feeling of community. We wanted to create an experience for specifically the third year students that are going to be going through the capstone project the next year. We wanted to create a community feeling where they could ask students, you know, what it was like, uh, you know, what tips could they get? They could meet new uh, or meet study leaders that would potentially take on uh, take them on uh, in projects the next year. Um, just giving them a feeling for what it is like to be a capstone project student so that they're more prepared in the next year, okay? Um, 
the idea is obviously to, to foster positive interactions as much as we can through gamification with this idea of running around and you know, scanning people's projects and collecting them onto a quest log. Okay. Now the quest log, as you will see there on the left-hand side, um, is what's part of your, pro, uh, your profile on the website, which was obviously, uh, I didn't mention this previously, but it was obviously done as a responsive design website. So it was built for mobile applications, but you could also do it obviously on a PC. Um, but the idea was that you have this quest log, right? So as you walk through the, uh, the building and find different projects, um, you've got a number of quests that you want to fulfill, okay? And every single time you scan a project in a specific study area, you would gain that badge, but obviously only the first time. And then combinations of badges will give you a focus. And focuses was what we tried to use to guide specifically the third year students into uh, different areas of study that they may find interesting in the next year, okay? In addition to just the scanning, uh, there was also the ability to vote for your favorite project. So obviously all the people that interacted on the day got to vote for their, uh, their favorite projects and the one that they uh, voted as the best, uh, we gave a little prize. Uh, we also gave a prize to, you know, the, the person that interacted the most, uh, the student that got the most interactions, et cetera, et cetera, just to make it kind of more fun and, and drive uh, engagement. So as I was mentioning, um, the badges were tied to the different study areas that are available to students in, uh, in their capstone projects, which is obviously driven by faculty and the things that faculty members are interested in. But the combination of different study areas gives you some sort of a focus, which you could use to try and uh, create your own idea of what kind of project you wanted to do in the following year. Okay? So that was aimed specifically at third year students. In terms of results, I'm obviously just going to show the results from, from our first uh, attempt at this. We've used it, obviously, in subsequent years to, to great uh, success. Uh, in the first one, we had 65 students, 17 academic study leaders, and 51 external visitors. And we played the game over three hours, where we logged 242 individual interactions, overwhelmingly positive. Um, now, this is something that, you know, in retrospect, uh, we, we, we thought about quite a bit. We found in subsequent years as well that the overwhelming majority of interactions are logged as positive. But we suspect that when people have negative experiences, they just don't log the interaction. So it seems incredibly positive, but that may be a slightly biased perspective. Um, so we're taking the, the, the positivity of the, of the experience with a little bit of a pinch of salt. But that's obviously just... Uh, um, an opinion rather than a scientific uh, fact. But in terms of actually trying to understand what this positivity, negativity, and, and neutral means, we obviously again drew from the literature. And McGonigal put forward this idea of gen. And gen is just basically the health of a social space. It was originally put forth by uh, Dasher Keltner. Uh, and from Keltner's work, obviously, in psychology, McGonigal put this forward as an idea of, you know, measuring the health of a social space. And it was, and it's a very simple concept. It's just the, the number of positive interactions over the number of negative interactions instantaneously. So if you're standing in a room and you're looking across it and seeing how people are interacting with each other, you count the number of positive interactions from your perspective and the number of negative interactions, and that ratio gives you a number. And that is the gen of the social space. Now, obviously, from a, from a computer science perspective, if you start with a number of zero over zero when you've done you know, no interactions, that breaks everything. So we took this idea and we just added one to say that we're starting the space on uh, 0.5 because we're measuring negative interactions and neutral interactions, both as negative, effectively, in terms of the, the calculation of our gen. So um, when we start the system, there is zero positive interaction, zero negative, zero neutral, but it's one over two. So the initial gen of our system, or adjusted gen as we called it, uh, was 0 0.5. But we did also measure gen uh, and just wanted to see you know, what it looks like uh, over time. Now, the problem is that measuring the environment, if we do it in a cumulative way, 
it creates a sort of filtering effect because obviously the initial interactions uh, would have a huge impact on uh, on the gen of the system. But as it goes further and further and further, you know, once you've got 220 positive interactions, the 221st one makes almost no difference uh, to the gen of the space. So there was this filtering effect uh, that, that sort of made it less effective. But we also looked at it from an instantaneous effect. So basically binning it into half hour bins um, to just see what kind of value it gives. And then we found that it was, it was too easily swapped specifically uh, with negative interactions. So because it's a ratio, it's more like a, a logarithmic value, to be honest. Uh, so I don't know if these graphs are maybe the best uh, display of it, but we found that doing it instantaneously really kind of swings it very quickly and doesn't really give you data that you can use to react off of. So we measured the gen in the first run, but we, we kind of discarded it at the end of the day, saying that it wasn't particularly useful. But overall, the location-based game worked very well. The feedback we received was, was exceptionally positive, and we've continued from there. So that's the location-based game. The next one we did uh, was the challenge-based system. So this was basically uh, based on a system called Super Better, which looks at this idea of psychological resilience. And basically, uh, the challenge-based system was used at the beginning of the year before projects are allocated, as well as during the journeyman phase. And the idea is to give students small projects uh, or little uh, MOOC-based projects that they can use to increase their resilience uh, in some area that they feel that they are not particularly strong at. Okay, So this is an example of structural gamification, where we're going to give them points um, to try and uh, encourage them to build up their, their resilience in, uh, in different areas, but we're not necessarily going to gamify the actual content that is inside of those challenges. Now, you'll see that it's marked on the, on the ludic layer uh, in light green, but dark green on the community. Um, so the idea initially was to, to use it to uh, increase the community feeling a little bit more, but we never implemented the ability for students to create their own challenges. So they could really only play off of the system, not really contribute to it themselves, uh, which we feel is definitely something we want to implement in the future. But it wasn't implemented just yet. So it, it was useful from a community perspective, but obviously limited to students being able to make comments on challenges and encourage other students to do their challenges as well. Uh, but they couldn't generate their own challenges on the system. So the four areas that we focused our, uh, uh, our challenges on was on this idea of uh, writing, mathematics, programming, and design, because we felt those are the things that students uh, you know, would struggle the most with uh, in, in their projects. And this was a way to do you know, a very small little project to just give you the confidence to do better at your larger capstone project. So here is an example of one of the projects, which was literally to generate a tone. Um, it's linked to a specific study area and is worth 50 points. And the challenge is literally just to create a one kilohertz tone. So whether it is through software or hardware or whatever the case may be, uh, it's a very small little challenge. And you beat this challenge by just sending an email of the proof of you doing it to one of the study leaders inside of the, inside of the system. And then you could obviously also give a rating uh, to how you experienced the, the, the creation or the, the, the doing of this challenge. And you could give comments so that other students can see how you experienced it. Now, the challenge were also tied to capstone project exit level outcomes. Uh, at the time, it was exit level outcomes. It's now graduate attributes, but the, the, the levels are exactly the same. And there were four main exit level outcomes that we were looking at being investigations, experiments, and data analysis, uh, engineering methods, skills, and tools, professional and technical communication, and then independent learning, okay? So the, uh, the instruction to the study leaders was to, to generate different, system, uh, different challenges that would speak directly to those exit level outcomes, but are done in a way that don't count marks. So it is just something for students to, to do, uh, to build up their confidence, but it doesn't count marks. So they don't get penalized for doing badly at it. The way it works is students find these challenges tied to specific study areas um, on the system. And then 
all the information they need is inside of that challenge, as well as how they would, uh, you know, prove that they've actually done the challenge. And all they have to do is they mark completion. So they indicate on their side that they've completed it. And then the study leader that actually created that challenge gets a challenge log. And then they will look at the proof that the student has sent and they will approve or decline it. If they approve, the student gets the, the points. If they decline, the student is notified. Obviously, it was declined. Please try again or, you know, uh, sorry, it didn't work. Okay. Uh, examples of the kind of challenges we used was to create a small kind of smartphone application, a very simple one, uh, to implement canny edge detection uh, from a computer, computer vision perspective, to research the frequencies that power line communication systems operate on, uh, create the system diagram of an automated gate motor system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this part of the system, I feel, was probably the one that was the least successful of the three, um, just because it was extra work for students and not necessarily fun enough. Um, you know, students were put under a lot of pressure and doing extra work that didn't necessarily contribute to their overall mark at the end of the day wasn't sufficiently you know, encouraging for them to actually participate in it enough. Uh, it also would have been useful if we had more challenges. In the end, we only had 16 challenges for students to do. Uh, but I, I definitely feel that like this could do with a little bit more design to make it more effective. But okay, those are the first two systems. But the one that I actually wanted to discuss in this presentation that you've waited for so long is the tender game. So this is the system that we used uh, at the beginning of the, of the course, between the student phase and the journeyman phase, to actually allocate projects to students. Okay? So this is obviously looking at the ludic layer as well as the procedural layer. And here we are actually gamifying the content a little bit, and it is a little bit like a serious game. So this one kind of straddles the, 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 the two concepts. Uh, it's sort of like a game, but it's kind of also like gamification. Um, so the idea here is that students compete for projects, but by creating tenders, okay? So this is coming from a bit of an authentic learning perspective, but when you go into the engineering field, one of the things that you're gonna have to do is write tenders, okay? People are gonna put forward projects and you need to tender for them by showing what you are going to do and how you're going to do it and how much it's going to cost, okay? So what we did is we created a number of projects that the students would be able to do in that year. And all of the students got to submit tenders to as many projects as they wanted, okay? They then indicated their preferences of all of the project, uh, the, tender, uh, the tenders that they've submitted, which ones they felt were you know, their favorite or least favorite, right? And once they've submitted all of their tenders after a period of time, it was initially done for two weeks, okay? The system flips. All of the tenders become anonymized, and then the students get to act in the, uh, the capacity of a tender board. So they get to look at the anonymous tenders that have been submitted and to decide which tender they believe would most effectively solve the problem that is being proposed by the study leader in that project. Now, the reason this is done in this specific way is that students felt that there was, uh, you know, previous to, to the system, there was a feeling that there was a lack of input taken by, uh, from students during project allocations, as well as a lack of transparency on the assignment mechanism. So this is what kind of kicked off the project for us, is we took, uh, we sent out a questionnaire to indicate, you know, what kind of problems there are in the course, and these are the things that, that were raised, okay? So we wanted to create a system that allows students an active voice in you know what projects are assigned to them okay but now once all the students have voted uh, along with faculty faculty obviously also get a vote in this we apply the gale shapely uh, algorithm or the stable marriage algorithm which is an algorithm that allows us to find a stable matching of uh, you know students to projects okay and i will explain what that means in a moment okay so once the stable, uh, the Gale Shapley algorithm has been run, or the stable marriage algorithm has been run, uh, uh, projects get assigned to students, and then they continue on with their journey, journeyman projects. Okay. So uh, obviously this was an extension of the web platform. So all that would happen is that students would look at the project details that are on the web uh, on the website, 
they would see which study leader it's for, as well as which study areas uh, it's tied to, along with any documentation or videos or, or whatever the case may be that the, student, uh, that the uh, study leader uploaded uh, in order to encourage students to look at it. Uh, and then students would be able to create these tenders also on the website where they can also, they do a small little write-up on the website, they can comment on each other's ones once it's been anonymized, um, and they can upload files or videos or URL links or whatever they, uh, they need to do to show that their tender is the best way of trying to solve that specific problem, okay? And once the system flips, uh, the interface is almost exactly the same, except the students can now look at each and every one of the projects, either the ones that they tended on or ones that they didn't on, and they could just rank the tenders that are there uh, from one to however many there are. So from that point on, uh, obviously it now requires a little bit of math. So for students, um, they got to rank their tenders from one to A, okay? But it is a personal rank. So it's only taking into account their opinion. For each of the projects, however, okay, we now need to look at votes that were given by students, votes that were given by study leaders, as well as the vote given by the actual project leader. So for that specific project, um, the person who's actually going to lead it, their say also needs to carry a bit of weight. So we just created a simple a set of score functions. So uh, this is looking at the student sum is literally just the rank given to each of the projects multiplied by a student multiplier. Then the study leader sum is again looking at the rank that was assigned by each study leader uh, to each and every one of the tenders for a project multiplied by a study leader multiplier. So the study leader multiplier is obviously a little bit higher than the student multiplier. What we did in the first year was to just look at the number of faculty members. So there were uh, 20 and the number of students, there were 89. And we just said that faculty and students would have an equal say in this. So each study leader's vote effectively counted 4.5 or 4.6 uh, times what a student was so just because uh, there was just so many fewer of them. And then finally, the project leader uh, 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 vote would be higher than a study leader vote as well. So that was double, okay? And all of this together would give a score, okay? For each specific tender, okay? And what the stable marriage algorithm then does is it looks at two similar sets or two similar size sets, okay? So in this specific example, it would be students and, or tenders and projects. And it goes through this in a way that was defined or described in the stable marriage algorithm as men and women, okay? So the idea was you would have this list of men and this list of women, and they would each have a preference for each of the other members of the opposite set. Okay, so each man has a preference for all of the women in the, in the woman set, and each woman has a preference for each of the men in the men set. Okay, and then it goes iteratively through a loop where each man then proposes to the top uh, woman in his preference list that he hasn't proposed to before. Okay, and the woman will look at all of the proposals that they receive and they will pick the best one. Okay? And this happens in a loop over and over and over again until it reaches a point where no more effective matches can be found. Okay? So there is no situation where a man, uh, two men can swap their, uh, their uh, uh, engagement to another woman such that both of them would be happier with the match. And this is called a stable matching. Okay? Very famous algorithm. Uh, has been used quite extensively in a number of different applications. And in fact, Gale and Shapley uh, won the Nobel Prize partially for the work they did in this. Uh, so it is you know, an awesome algorithm to use. However, uh, that describes a situation where you have perfect information for both sets. Okay? So every single one of the men has full you know, preference list for all of the women on the opposite side of the algorithm. Now, obviously in our situation, where students only tendered for some of the projects and those projects only um, you know, had a preference list for the tenders that they had, we don't have full information, okay? So what this meant was that in the first time we ran this, uh, you know, using this algorithm, we had you know, the bulk of students we could assign to their first choice, 
Um, so on the graph on the left, the student preferences are in blue and the project preferences are in green. So the bulk of the assignments were done you know, on the first choice, second choice had a number, uh, third choice had a few, fourth choice, fifth choice, not so much. But then we had a number of projects that fell into indifference. Okay? So that is a situation that arises when a project gets assigned to you to create this, uh, uh, this stable matching. But the match that you have got is not a project that you disliked, but it was that you one that you had no actual preference for. And the reason we got this is that we obviously allow students to pick, you know, uh, you know, all the projects that they want to tender for. Okay, so there were no students that submitted zero tenders, but there were some students that submitted only one tender. To say that I want to have that project, and I've got no preference on anything else. And of the the projects that we had, so we had. 89 students and 92 projects, 19 of the projects received zero tenders. So no one wanted them. So there was no way for the algorithm to, to really create a stable match without indifference, because obviously when there's zero preference given, uh, you know, this, this creates a situation that the algorithm can only do so much. Okay? But it also kind of made us ask the question of, you know, Given the numbers we had, we had 89 students and 238 tenders submitted. Uh, that gives us an average of 2.67 uh, tenders per student. So if we want to avoid indifference, how many tenders should there actually be? Uh, so for the, for the stable marriage algorithm, how much data do you need before you start dropping into indifference? Now, obviously you can't predict everything, but they needed to be some sort of a baseline number that we could use in our design uh, to, to kind of make things work a little better than this in the first one of the algorithm. So because I'm not that good at math, um, I obviously did this with simulations. So instead of kind of trying to, to, to work out some sort of an epic model, um, I instead ran a simulation from uh, N5 to 200, so five students to 200 students with five to 200 projects, where for each uh, number in, I simulated 500 times, um, you know, a random distribution of preferences for all students and all projects. And I then found uh, the graph on the left and the graph on the right. So the graph on the left is the number of elements uh, versus the average preference position of match. So that's obviously not uh, you know, the, the, that's just the average preference. So it, there are obviously students that would be given a first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Um, in this specific example of 89, it worked out that we would need 3.8 tenders per student, as opposed to the 2.67 that we received. Okay. But it also showed the inherent imbalance uh, in the stable marriage algorithm, where the men, in which in our case, obviously the students, um, would get a preference position that is much, much, much lower than what is given to the woman. And that is because in the algorithm, uh, the men can propose to any one of the women on the list that they've got, okay? Uh, so they, with 89 or 92 projects, the, the student can propose a tender to any one of those 92 projects. Uh, whereas the project can only give a preference to the ones that tendered to them. So women can only accept or reject proposals that are given to them by men. So they don't have access to the full list of the, uh, or the full set on the opposite side. So that means that for the students, we could say that there was an average preference of 3.8 tenders needed uh, for us to get a good chance of, of not falling into indifference. Whereas for the projects, uh, it needed closer to 20. Um, preference numbers for it to not fall into indifference. And we obviously did some, some curve fitting to, to give a formula for that. So what we did in that case is we took the learning uh, from this process and this uh, um, uh, uh, simulation, and we said that we would change the design to try and actually take this into account into the next year. So the first time we ran this was in 2017, um, and we changed it slightly in 2018, which I'll go through in a minute, okay? So for the most part, in terms of results, the students and study leaders experienced the project as very positive, uh, especially the allocation side of things. 
Uh, they really felt that autonomy was greatly appreciated I mean, and having a say and being able to actually contribute to, you know, what sort of matching you would get or what sort of project you would get is something the students really have appreciated. It also lessened the administrative burden uh, compared to previous years where the course coordinator would have to kind of manually try and assign all these projects, which led to the problems in the beginning. And then uh, we obviously took the simulation that we did to create uh, the value of M uh, such that we would have the best of chance of success into 2018 with a slightly different way of doing things. Now, uh, here, so what we did in the 2018 version is that we use the same algorithm, but this time, instead of tendering for individual projects, student applied for, to one of seven slots that were available to each study leader. And they sent in a CV uh, effectively to the study leader saying that I would like to work with you uh, in this year in creating my capstone project. Now that way, uh, by each student effectively picking one study leader, they automatically got all seven slots filled with a preference. Okay, um, So that means that each study leader only needed to get three students applying to them for them to get all 24 of their slots uh, you know, given a preference. They would obviously need at least seven students in order to fill that up, but it, give a, it gave a much better uh, you know, set of data to the algorithm for it to calculate the stable matching. Okay? So with the first version, with the tendering, it took us five rounds to get all the projects uh, assigned to students. With the 2018 version, it only took three rounds, and the third round was literally just 12 students that didn't submit anything. Um, so in two rounds, we could submit all or we could uh, apply uh, or uh, assign all of the projects to students by the second round. And the third round had to be done manually because students didn't submit enough information. But the same stable marriage algorithm was used very effectively. Another change that we did in 2018, and this is based on feedback from the study leaders, is that they didn't all vote. And the reason for that is that they felt that uh, their they got this list of students, as I mentioned previously, that they could only pick from the students that actually sent a, ten, a, a tender to their project, which means that if they felt none of them were, if, uh, were applicable, uh, there was no way for them to say, well, I don't want any of these. Uh, they would kind of be forced into a situation to take one of the students that actually tendered to them. Even if they didn't vote, there was no way for them to, to kind of not work with a specific student. Um, so in the 2018 version, we effectively added a black ball uh, for the study leaders to say that they could vote uh, by, by kind of creating this ranking. But if there was a student that they felt didn't apply at all or, do, or wasn't applicable at all, they could decline to work with them. And that student would then automatically move into the next round if they weren't allocated to a different study leader. And after we added the black ball, we got 100% adoption rate by study years, 100% adoption rate by students, and it worked great. Um, that worked for a while until 2021, where we decided to change things slightly, although the algorithm is done exactly the same. Uh, instead of doing a CD this time, students then created a website. Uh, where they would put forward not only their portfolio of work that they've done up at this point, similar to what they would do with a CD, CD, but they would also put forward what they think would be a great project to work with. Where previously, um, study leaders would basically go off of the CD and the ideas the students have uh, and then try and define it once they were assigned. In 2021, we rather created a situation where students got to define their own projects and, stu and study leaders would then take that uh, and work with the student going forward. In terms of um, results, uh, now in this course specifically, we weren't trying to you know, up the pass mark, but obviously the pass mark is something that is you know, connected to students' experiences. So we specifically looked at students that passed the course because the way we use the failure mark is that uh, it's not kind of linear. 
Um, so students don't fail with 29% and a student that did 30% is better than a student that failed at 29%. Instead, um, you know, the, the levels of failure are indicative of students not meeting one of the exit level outcomes. So we removed the students that failed the course because obviously theirs uh, was not linear. And we looked at the students that passed the course and compared that to the three previous years uh, to see what kind of an impact we had. So we looked at 2017 and 2018, which is where we kind of did the bulk of our work and compared that to the three years before that. And we found that obviously from a, 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 a mean perspective, uh, all both the years that, uh, that we implemented the system, there was a higher mean than the three years before that. Uh, but we also wanted to see whether it is obviously a statistically valid uh, increase. So comparing 2014, 15, and 16 to 2017, um, there is a statistically significant uh, impact. Uh, there is a, a mistake on the slide that top left uh, the 0 0.094 should be yellow, not uh, it should be yellow, not green, uh, because it's actually you know it's not at 0 0.05 alpha, it's at 0 0.1 alpha. Uh, but as I said, uh, the mean was always more positive in the years that we implemented the system versus not implementing the system. But this was done, or this analysis was done using the Welsh's T statistic, and then to uh, from there to determine the the actual impact. Uh, it was not a massive impact. It was a pretty small impact at the, uh, at the end of the day, uh, but always positive. The 2018 year wasn't as good as 2017, but we had a bit of an upset in the mid middle of the year where three study leaders uh, unfortunately resigned and started their own company uh, away from the university. So that was quite an impact on number of students. But even with that, uh, the marks all improved. Okay. And that is my story. I hope that you found that interesting. Uh, I know this is not uh, the usual computer science or physics thing, but it is definitely the kind of thing that I find fun. And uh, at this point, I open for any questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Yapi, for a very interesting uh, talk. <laughs> it, uh, uh, maybe we should start gamifying also our NITEX colloquia a little bit, yeah, <laughs> and, and see how, uh, and, and look for your advice. Yeah. So um, I don't see at this moment in time any raised uh, hands or questions in the in the Q and A, but I would like to encourage our participants to to raise their hands and and we can uh, easily give them the right to to ask the question in uh, in in person. So please don't be shy. It was either entirely perfect or complete and utter nonsense. Yeah, no, we all need a little bit of time to, 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 to formulate uh, questions. No, I like very much, uh, uh, Yapi, your, your tender game. And, uh, and I was wondering whether you should uh, sell it to government, <laughs> because that's <laughs> always a big problem. Yeah. I, I think they play a different tender game. <laughs> I know, I know, I know, but the name is the same. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that was very nice. But uh, um, uh, you know, you know, you, you probably have all these um, all, all these tools developed. Um, are they uh, just um, proprietary tools, or are they open source? Um, so uh, we we obviously developed this entirely for the university. Uh, so we've kind of debated actually open sourcing it. We've actually applied the same system onto two academic conferences as well. Uh, okay. where we applied the, the location-based game specifically to, to people kind of going between different sessions and then, uh, you know, logging their interactions that they had with the speaker. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was two conferences in, in the Netherlands. Uh, so we started open sourcing it, but the code is not as neat as I'd like it to be. <laughs> um, so I figured we would clean it up a little bit before, before we open source at the end of the day, but that is probably where we're going to end up. Um, okay, okay. And, uh, um, and, 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 you know, in, in this time and age, yeah, where all the conference, most conferences and schools and so on uh, are, are online, um, do you have a version of your software to organize kind of uh, virtual conferences or workshops or events to make them a little bit more fun? It's something that we, uh, in 2019 and 2020, 
uh, there was actually a different kind of approach taken to, to the interaction side of things in the middle of the year, uh, where, uh, and it wasn't actually myself building it, it was, it was actually another PhD student, uh, but it didn't work as well as was envisioned. Um, yeah. because there, there are tools that already exist to make online interaction, uh, you know, happen faster. So things like Zoom and Teams and, and all of that already fill that niche quite effectively. And, and when you try and gamify it, it almost, it almost detracts from it rather than adds to it. Uh, because there, there's sort of a, a limit to what you can achieve with gamification before it starts becoming... Uh, negative, I would say. Um, so what we found in our work specifically is that gamification is very effective in the short term. So when mm -hmm. you're trying to do, so something like a conference works very well because it's like two or three days uh, and, and then people will interact there. But beyond that point, the, the engagement that you get from it drops off very, very quickly uh, because it's, it's not really exciting anymore. The kinds of things that drive people uh, to engage more in games is generally unique experiences. Yeah. Um, so, so games kind of bombard you with, you know, different levels. So each level is different. Each monster you fight is different. Um, you're, you're constantly, you know, trying to engage with newer and newer and newer information. Uh, the only games that don't do that are very deep strategically. So if you look at a game like chess, chess can engage you for many, many, many years but it is an exceptionally complex game uh, when you get right down to it. And gamification works at its best when it is not that complex, when it is very easy to, to get on board with. So a long-term engagement, I, I wouldn't necessarily go for a gamified approach. Okay, okay, okay. But maybe for shorter events, as you say. Yes, for shorter events, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, because, you know, for instance, from, from experience with, with NITEX, yeah, and, you know, every month we organize mini schools, and it's very difficult to get feedback from the students during the, the, the online lectures to, to see whether they engage or whether the Zoom is just running in the background and they're doing something else, yeah? So it would be yeah. really nice to have some tool <laughs> to, 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 to get the feedback. Yeah, so the, when you have something, please let us know, because it would be very useful, yeah? I, I will see if I can find it. There, there is actually a tool like that. I just can't remember the name now. Okay, where okay. Um, you can you can pitch uh, quick uh, polls, um, so polls and questions that you quickly throw up on the screen, and it will mm -hmm. track uh, the answers that people give. So it's something similar to uh, that. Uh, Who wants to be a millionaire? Uh, uh -huh. Where they ask the audience. And then there is you know, a percentage assigned to the kind of uh, the answers that the audience gave. Um, oh, okay, okay, and okay. that is actually a, a, a system that is also slightly gamified. Uh, I'll okay. see if I can find the, if I can remember okay, the name, okay. I'll, I'll email you. That would be fun, yeah, yeah, because it would be nice to, to, to test it and, and play, yeah. and play <laughs> around with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, perfect, excellent. Um, are there further questions of, the, of, of, of our uh, audience of our participants. Yes, please, uh, Martin. You you are uh, you can talk. Yeah, please. Oh, all right. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Um, yeah, the you no know, like gamification. I think it's it's good for learning. Uh, I just want to to add something. Uh, because uh, I, I'm also aware of another um, game called Petronia. So it's a game for, for students who are learning corporate governance. And uh, it also makes use of animations and so forth. So I don't know if you are also aware of um, you know, that game because what, what you are doing it's uh, closely related to, to that game. And um, I'm sure if you can also have time, you will be able to learn more in terms of, you know, like how you can improve the system moving forward. Yeah, oh, thank you very much, Martin. Um, it, the, the way you describe it, it actually sounds more like a, like a serious game. So we've actually also built uh, a couple of other games that are more like traditional games, 
um, which are sort of like adventures that, that students can go on to teach uh, concepts like information theory, uh, where we've actually built two games to, to, to convey that. And those are, are very much uh, you know, animated and you run around and you solve puzzles and everything. Uh, so maybe one day in the future, I will, I will show off that system as well. Uh, but this one obviously is more, you know, gamification rather than serious game. And the way that you describe that, it sounds very much like a serious game, like an actual game that you play that by playing the game, you learn about corporate governance, if I understand correctly. Yes, yes, you are, you are, you are right. Uh, yeah. So, you know, like the structure of the game, you start by, you know, learning the, the materials on corporate governance. So they create a situation. In, you can even go into the meeting with the minister, the president, and so forth. So it's, yeah, it's, it's quite um, interesting. So I just thought I should uh, yeah, no, you know, like bring it to your attention. Could you, could you post the name in the chat? I'd like to actually read up a bit more about it. All right, let me look for it. Uh, I, I will send it now. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, <clears throat> yep. It seems that uh, there are no more uh, no more questions. Then uh, um, it is my my pleasant duty to 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 thank you very much for the very interesting talk and the and the nice uh, presentation and for sharing this. Uh, promising approach to, to engaging students in, uh, in capstone projects. Yeah, that's a very nice word <laughs> that I don't use very often, but I like it very much. Yeah, so thank you very much for that as well. And, um, and, I, and I will um, invite all the, all the participants to join us for a short uh, uh, social interaction, maybe in a, in a gamified <laughs> space, yeah. just to, to simulate uh, the, the, the standard chat after, after the talk. And, uh, and one day, Yapi, when um, we will interact uh, in person again, uh, we will uh, we, we owe you a lunch, dinner, coffee, uh, which we would have had if the talk was, uh, was, was in person. So, so thank you very much, everyone. The link to Kumo Space is in the chat, and it should be in your, open in, uh, in your browser. So we will see you there uh, in, in, uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have a, have a good rest of the day. Have a good evening. Bye.